B I O with a B I O, B I O with a B I O, birdie, 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 welcome. Hi Alex, welcome to our virtual biology camp lecture on chemistry of life part two. Yeah, Alex, something like that. These four biomolecules are what make up life. And in our last video, we focused on carbohydrates and lipids, which is why we're going to be focusing on proteins and nucleic acids in today's lecture. So make sure you take good notes. Let's first begin with proteins, which are made up of long chains of amino acid monomers. These chains of amino acids are often called polypeptide chains. No, Alex, I said peptide, not pepto. Peptide refers to the type of bonds formed between each amino acid. And because it's a lot of amino acids joined together, making a long chain, that's why we call it a polypeptide chain. Yes, Alex, that's right. Each amino acid shares a common structure, which consists of four essential elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And the best way to recognize an amino acid is by looking for the four major groups surrounding a center carbon, an amine group, carboxyl group, hydrogen, and an R group. Yes, Alex, great way to recognize an amine group, which is the side that has a nitrogen, and the carboxyl group is the side that has COOH. Good question, Alex. R is not going to be found on the periodic table as an element. The R group is actually used to represent various carbon groups that may be attached to a particular amino acid. Yes, Alex, that's a good way to think of it. The R can represent different groups, just like X represents different values in math. There's actually 20 common amino acids, which all differ solely on their R groups, which makes them uniquely shaped and named. Yes, Alex, that's right. Each amino acid's main structure does not change, only the R group is different, which is why we often illustrate amino acids with a color-coded circle and an abbreviation of their name, such as this one for the amino acid lysine. Glad you asked, Alex. As we mentioned, amino acids are the monomers of proteins. So in order to make a polypeptide chain, which is a protein polymer, there must be a lot of amino acids bonded together by these peptide bonds. I guess that's a good way to remember what a polypeptide chain looks like. But how about we get back to how these long chains of amino acids make different proteins? So looking at the chain that you made, that sequence of amino acids in the chain would make a specific protein that has a unique shape specific for it to do its job, also known as a function. For instance, this amino acid sequence could be for a protein specific for giving you your black hair. Alex, I think you've been watching West Side Story a bit too much, but if that helps you remember it, sure, why not? Overall, you just need to understand that the amino acid sequence gives the protein a specific shape, which is directly related to its function. Glad you asked, Alex. As we mentioned, every amino acid has the same basic structure, but vary in the R group. Well, certain R groups repel or attract to other R groups, which means that they affect the way the amino acid chains fold, giving the protein a particular shape. Um, sure, Alex, good way to visualize it. And you're right, the amino acid cysteines tend to make special bonds called disulfide bridges, which help the folded protein maintain its shape. Yeah, Alex, I guess that's one way of thinking of it. Just note that polypeptide chains can fold in different ways, based on the various interactions seen between R groups of some amino acids. For instance, hydrogen bonds, disulfide bridges, ionic bonds, or even hydrophobic interactions may start to form between the R groups of some amino acids. That's going to cause the chain to fold and bend into a certain unique shape. Yes, that's right, Alex. So as you can see, the number and sequence of amino acids in the polypeptide chain is going to determine how the chain will fold, giving the protein a unique shape. Now, this unique shape is directly related to a protein's function. Thus, if a protein is not folded properly or some bonds are damaged for some reason, the protein is no longer functional, which is what happens to denatured proteins. They lose their unique shape. Good way to shape. remember that, Alex, as in the protein is now out of its natural shape, meaning it is no longer functional. This may happen when high temperatures are reached or the optimal pH is out of balance. I'm sure, Alex, if that helps you remember it. Okay, so now that you have an idea of what mon Monomers make up proteins and what they look like. Now let's talk about the different functions proteins may have. Proteins may act as antibodies, messengers, transport proteins, enzymes. They may even act as the last resort energy as well as structural support. 
No, Alex, antibodies are not against your body. They're actually proteins that are against foreign bodies. In other words, they help your body fight against invaders such as bacteria and viruses. We're going to go into more details of these types of proteins during later lectures regarding the immune system. Now, as for messenger and transport proteins, we're going to see these in more detail during a later lecture regarding the cell membrane, in which these types of proteins play a role in cell communication and transporting of ions and molecules into and out of the cell. Now, as for enzymes, yes, Alex, glad that you remembered from our Chemistry of Life Part 1 video, but what you do need to understand is that enzymes can actually help speed up the breakdown or synthesis of biomolecules. Remember, synthesis means to make. Glad you asked, Alex. Enzymes are proteins that help speed up reactions. They don't actually break down or build biomolecules themselves. I guess that's one way to think of it, Alex. Now keep in mind that all chemical reactions release and absorb energy. Reactions will vary between two scenarios endothermic and exothermic, in which they relate to heat energy entering or exiting the reaction. Yes, that's right, Alex. The prefix endo means enter, exo means exit. As for the thermic, that refers to thermal energy, also known as heat energy. You got it, Alex. Endothermic would mean heat energy entering the reaction, as opposed to exothermic, in which heat energy exits the reaction. That's right, Alex. Plants absorb energy from the sun and store some of that energy in carbohydrates. Take a look at this graph. Notice the energy of the products is higher than the reactants, meaning that additional energy was absorbed into the carbohydrates, which are the products. Therefore, we say that carbohydrates store energy through this reaction. Yes, Alex, that's right. This endothermic reaction is also known as photosynthesis, which we're going to discuss in later lectures. Now take a look at this next graph. Notice that the energy of these products is lower than the reactants because additional energy is released. What would be an example of this type of reaction? Yes, that's right, Alex. Additional energy is being released when the grasshopper breaks down the carbohydrates found in plants. When broken down, that energy stored in them is going to be released for the cells to use. Yes, Alex, that's right. Calories labeled on the nutrition fact label is referring to the amount of heat energy that can be released from the biomolecules it is consisting of. Notice how they also identify the calories from fats. Why do you think? Yes, Alex, that's right. Lipids store almost twice the amount of energy than carbohydrates, which is why we use lipids as a way to reserve energy for later use, as opposed to carbohydrates, which are used up rather quickly for daily energy needs. Good question, Alex. Proteins do contain energy. However, it is very little energy as opposed to lipids and carbohydrates, which is why our bodies tend to not break down proteins with the intention of using them for energy. Now, another reason we don't tend to use proteins for energy is that proteins have many other useful and essential functions in the body. However, if the body is low on lipids and carbohydrates, meaning that it's in starvation mode, then that's when the body will begin to break down anything that it can, just to simply stay alive. But what do you think will happen when proteins begin to be broken down for energy? Yes, Alex, that is absolutely correct. The breakdown of proteins for energy will lead to a decrease of proteins used for essential functions performed in the body. For instance, structural will be a major function that will be affected, such as those found in the muscles. When proteins found in muscles are broken down due to starvation, that's when the body begins to go through muscle atrophy due to malnourishment. Okay, so now let's get back on track. It's extremely important that you understand that chemical reactions must reach a certain level of energy known as activation energy in order to start the reaction. However, sometimes this required amount of energy is a lot, which means that it's going to take a long time to obtain it unless they have help from certain proteins known as enzymes, which lower the activation energy needed. Yeah, Alex, I guess you could see it that way. Enzymes basically reduce the price for the reaction. Just keep in mind that that price was energy, since chemical reactions require a specific amount of energy for the reaction to take place, which we refer to as activation energy. Okay, so what if I said that no enzyme was present? What now? Can the reaction still take place? You're right, Alex. If the enzyme is not present, the reaction may still take place. 
but it might take longer to get started until it saves enough activation energy for the reaction to start. Now, enzymes are often referred to as catalysts, which simply means that they are speeding up the reaction. I'm glad you're getting it, Alex, but now let's get into more details of how exactly enzymes manage to lower the activation energy for reactions. Overall, this takes place during three major interactions between enzymes and reactants, which are referred to as substrates. The first interaction involves enzymes bringing substrates closer together to help the reaction get started quicker. But it's important for you to understand that enzymes have a very specific shape that has a special location called the active site, which is very substrate specific, meaning only the right substrate can fit in this location to form an enzyme substrate complex. Yes, Alex, that's right. Enzymes and substrates can be seen as a lock and key. There's actually a scientific model known as the lock and key model, which explains how enzymes work. For the purposes of this class, just understand that an enzyme's active site is substrate specific, and when they bind at that location, they form the second interaction known as the enzyme substrate complex, which is where the reaction actually takes place. Now, since the bonds become weaker in this complex, this means that less activation energy is going to be needed for these slightly weakened bonds to be broken. You're right, Alex. Once the reaction finishes, the enzyme can separate from the products. But just keep in mind that enzymes are involved in reactions which may break the substrate or put substrates together. Overall, notice that the enzyme does not change in the reaction. Once it is free, it goes out looking for another substrate to help. However, what if the temperature or pH of this enzyme's environment were to change drastically? What would happen? Yes, that's right, Alex. Since enzymes are proteins, they can become denatured if they are not maintained in their optimal environment. And if they are denatured, that means they lose their shape, which is substrate specific, meaning the substrate and enzyme will no longer fit, meaning the enzyme is no longer functional. Yeah, Alex, something like that. Overall, there are many different types of enzymes, each with their own unique job and substrate specificity. That's right, Alex, they're all different in shape based on the substrate they work with, which is why we identify these enzymes with unique names linked to the substrates that they work with. For instance, a protease is an enzyme that works with proteins as a substrate, which is made reference by the prefix protea, which sounds like protein. Okay, what about lipase? What do you think this enzyme is involved with? Yes, Alex, that's right. Lipase sounds like lipids, which tells us that this enzyme is involved okay, with so lipids. Okay, so what about amylase? What can you tell me about this molecule? Yes, Alex, you're right. The ending ace tells us that this is an enzyme. As for amyl, it is referring to a carbohydrate known as amylose, which is found in starch. Good job, Alex, like the starch found in crackers. Now try to think for a second. What happens when you place a cracker in your mouth after a couple of minutes? Yeah, that's right, Alex. You start to build up a lot of saliva surrounding that cracker. Why do you think? Right again, Alex, saliva actually has special enzymes such as amylase that speed up the reactions meant to break down carbohydrates such as those found in crackers. Good job, Alex, but just keep in mind that enzymes are not always involved in the breakdown of polymers. Sometimes they're involved in making polymers. For instance, RNA polymerase. You're right, Alex, RNA polymerase is an enzyme that speeds up the reaction of RNA polymers being made, which is a process that we will later discuss in greater detail. Now, for now, just know that enzymes help reactions by acting as catalysts in either making or breaking polymers, and they can be identified by their suffix ACE. Okay, so back to what else proteins can do. Yes, Alex, certain structural proteins are responsible for unique characteristics that you may have, such as black or blonde hair, or perhaps eye color, or ear shape, or many other characteristics that make you so unique, which is why proteins are found among all organisms. However, each organism has their own unique set of proteins that make them look the way they do.
No, Alex, that's not how it works. Yes, you do obtain proteins from meats, such as those found among cows. However, your body will break down those consumed proteins into the smallest forms, which are amino acids, and then use all of those amino acids as spare parts when making its own proteins to make you look the way you look. Yes, Alex, that's right. You need certain instructions to produce the protein responsible for hair color, which is melanin. But as you can imagine, there are different variations of hair color as there is of melanin. Basically, there are two types of melanin. Pheomelanin, which gives yellow and red color, while eumelanin gives brown color. Now, to obtain your specific unique hair color, you need the right variation of melanin, which is only produced with the right protein instructions. I'm glad you asked, Alex. The instructions for all your proteins are actually found in your genetic information, which brings us to our fourth biomolecule, known as nucleic acids. Now, there are two types of nucleic acids that you need to be able to identify. First is the deoxyribonucleic acid, also known as DNA, which is double-stranded like the one that you just drew. Then there is ribonucleic acid, also known as RNA, which is single-stranded, and both are made up of nucleotide monomers. Yeah, you're right, Alex. This biomolecule is the one that has all five essential elements, which are referred to as CHOMP, representing carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Now, each nucleotide shares a common structure that you must know. Um, sure, Alex, that's one way to remember what a nucleotide looks like. Just make sure that you know what each shape represents. For instance, the pool is actually a phosphate, the house is a pentose sugar, and the garage is a nitrogenous base. Good question, Alex. As we said, the two nucleic acids are called deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid. Well, the deoxyribo represents the type of sugar found in its nucleotides, which we call deoxyribose, and ribo represents the sugar called ribose. Great job, Alex. You remembered from our last lecture that ribose is a five-carbon pentagon-shaped sugar and it's actually found in the nucleotides of RNA. Now, as for DNA, it has deoxyribose sugar, which is very similar to ribose. Now, the only difference is the prefix deoxy, which means that it is missing an oxygen on the second carbon. Good question, Alex. Both DNA and RNA nucleotides have the same type of phosphate groups. Now, as for the nitrogenous bases, well, this is where it gets tricky. Both DNA and RNA have four different nitrogenous bases. Now, three of them are the same for both DNA and RNA, which includes adenine, guanine, and cytosine. Now, as for the fourth nitrogenous base, that's where DNA and RNA differ. DNA has thymine, and RNA has uracil. Yes, that's right, Alex. We often use the first letter of the nitrogenous bases to identify which type it is. And you also need to know the way nitrogenous bases like to pair, as in A pairs with T and C pairs with G. Nice to see that you're brushing up on your Spanish, Alex, which is a good way to remember the pairing rule, which we are going to get into much more details in later lectures regarding DNA replication and protein synthesis. Right now, just be sure to know what a nucleotide monomer looks like. Okay, so now that we do, let's take a look at what these monomers end up building. Now, we call these nucleic acid polymers. Now, the type is going to depend on which type of nucleotide monomer is seen that belongs to either DNA or those that belong to RNA. Yes, that's right, Alex. DNA is double-stranded, also known as a double helix because of its twisted shape. And the second strand, as you depicted here, is anti-parallel to the first. So good job. And as for RNA, it is single-stranded only. Okay, so why are these two nucleic acids so important? Yes, that's exactly correct, Alex. Both carry genetic information. And in later lectures, we're going to focus more on the functional differences between the two. Okay, so let's take a look at the big picture of these four major biomolecules that are essential to living organisms, including ourselves. They can be found pretty much everywhere in our bodies. Let's quickly review each of them. First are carbohydrates, which are made up of sugar monomers consisting of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and they serve as a source of quick energy. Now, they are the main source of fuel for organisms. Then we have lipids, which are made up of glycerol and fatty acid monomers, and they consist of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and they primarily serve as long-term energy storage. Now, they actually store twice the amount of energy than carbohydrates. Okay. Third is proteins, which are made up of amino acid monomers, and they consist of carbon, 
hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, and they serve as enzymes, transport proteins, structural, and many more. Now, nucleic acids, these are made up of nucleotide monomers, and they consist of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphate, and they serve as genetic information carriers, such as the role seen among DNA and RNA. This concludes our virtual biology camp lecture on chemistry of life part two. Hope you enjoyed it and that's it. Have a great one.